Welcome to CS4510. Uh, the topic of today is Gödel's incompleteness. He's German, so it should be Gödel's incompleteness. Um, so today is probably the most important topic in the whole class. Um, maybe not even the first half, but more of the second half. The first half is sort of a, uh, a historical precursor to the other parts. The f this is like my favorite theorem of the course, probably. Um, definitely my favorite theorem of the unit. Um, if, if you talk to old people, they're always like, what is the one theorem you remember in the class? It might be this one, or the one in the second half of today. So in some sense, it's the only reason you take this class, is to give you a perspective of this. So last time we left off, we were talking about logic. We use the axiom of unrestricted comprehension and a well-formed formula. Axiom of unrestricted comprehension was, uh, again, there exists some y uh, for all x, such that x is an element of y if and only if uh, a well-formed formula was true. So there, you use the axiom of unrestricted comprehension, which basically just says there, if for any predicate there exists a set of elements to satisfy that, you use a well-formed formula to be uh, the, the set of elements which do not contain themselves. And then you, spe you perform axiom of specification for x is equal to y. And you'll derive that y is an element of y if and only if y is not an element of y. So something is true if and only if it is false. The whole theory must be thrown out. It's a simple exercise for you to prove. And maybe I'm still debating if I want to put it on the homework, where if you have a, any sort of formal system where true, something is both true and false simultaneously, that there exists a proof of, a, a proof of everything and a disproof of everything. It's not too difficult to prove. It falls sort of vacuously from an implication. Uh, this was a big upset to uh, Fredge and other formalists who spent uh, several years trying to cope. The better way we do it is with, with something called restricted comprehension, which is that we only allow you to uh, comprehend over uh, subsets that have already been defined. So for x, for z some previously known subset, you may quantify some of its subsets according to a predicate. And this, on the surface, appears to avoid uh, self-referential statements, such as Russell's paradox, or at least the ones that cause problems. Another thing that Russell did was called the theory of types. So he wrote this book called Principia Mathematica. He goes off with Whitehead, and he spends the next 20 years trying to formalize mathematics in a very rigorous way, using what are called the theory of the types. And everything has a type. And those things, objects which have types may only refer to types less than it. And so on. And this, on the surface, appears to prevent self-reference. Um, if an object may only discuss those of a lesser type, then no object may discuss its own semantic properties. And so such it should be impossible to construct self-referential statements. So on the surface, it appeared that you could prevent sentences that, for example, I am uh, not true. This was basically what Russell's uh, paradox entailed. It constructed a sentence which discussed its own truth value, put it, in the put it in the negative, and then suddenly you've derived an inconsistency. So by avoiding the self-reference, it appears on the surface that you can uh, avoid something like this. And you know, again, this is a three-volume work. It's a, it's a, his masterpiece. You spend 20 years on something that's only like two-eighths of your life. So, you know, 25% of the time you're alive or even awake, you spent your time writing these books. You would hope to, to be secure. Uh, Godel, a young guy, came along. So this is Russell's paradox. Godel came along and sh was just kind of exploring it. And he, found, he, just, he made the following discovery, that you, although you could be prevented from discussing truth or certain semantic properties with self-reference, you could never avoid a discussion about provability of a statement. So he says, I am not provable. So the first sentence is a sentence that could not be constructed by the theory of types. Theory of types avoided construction of the first sentence. But the second sentence could never not be constructed. You can always construct the second sentence. And if something is not provable, well, what does that mean? Right? We'll talk about that later today. You can always avoid discussion of truth, but you could never avoid discussion. You could never prevent discussion about provability. Um, so that's all Gödel's incompleteness basically is. We will use this 
uh, Godel basically does a crazy hack, and he do, you know, does this uh, glitch, and he basically great, creates these great, beautiful theorems out of it. Right? So before we get into what those are, let's talk about what, what um, we would hope the system to have. The system should have the following two properties. One is completeness. And a system is complete intuitively if all that is true is provable. So like if uh, uh, f is a well-formed formula over the Principia Mathematica, then there is a proof from Principia Mathematica to f or a proof of Principia Mathematica to the negation of f. Right? And again, uh, by well-formed formula here, I mean not a predicate. I mean, so, so you, uh, like, a, like a proposition. Something that is, if a, if, a, if a formula has no free variables, it may be assigned a truth value. Uh, but only after its free variables, free variables are either bound to quantifiers or uh, evaluated at does it, uh, can it be assigned a truth value. For example, if I do like uh, n greater than 7, that cannot be assigned a truth value until either the variable is bound or you evaluate it. Once you evaluate it, it's true or false. So what you do is you just say exist n, so it's an n is greater than 7. Now it can be assigned a truth value, right? So completeness, those statements which are true have to have proofs that they are true. Completeness is basically uh, a very desirable property of uh, uh, things. Anything that is true has a proof that it is true, right? Consistency. Consistency uh, basically says the system is free of contradiction. Now I'm going to be using reference to Principia Mathematica or Principia Mathematica. We haven't talked about the axiom of Principia Mathematica. It's far too complicated, convoluted, and complex. It's totally not usable. Like it's a really bad, maybe not, maybe not design, but presentation is really hard. I mean, it's 3,000 pages. Um, but Notice that as I do this, convince yourself you could replace Principia Mathematica with any reasonable attempt of a formal system of logic to encapsulate all of mathematics, right? By free of contradiction, we mean if, like, uh, for all uh, f that is expressible as well for formulas in the system, either, uh, excuse me, not either, but f and the negation of f is always false. So no statement is true and false simultaneously. None of the things that which can be taken as proofs of this within, this within the theory can contradict each other. Right? It, again, if you do not have consistency on the very, if you do, do not have consistency, you do not even have a model. You don't have anything. Consistency is the bare minimum we would require of a system to be usable. Completeness is the bare minimum. Uh, it's not the bare minimum, but it would be a nice feature. You know, basically, you could think of a completeness closer to uh, the way a vector space has a basis, and the basis spans the vector space, right? Everything that is an element of the vector space is a linear combination of the elements of the basis, right? So it's the same thing, where the axioms are complete, they cover everything in some sense, right? They're total. There's nothing that's just kind of ignored. There's no dark area of the map. So if Principia was uh, attempted to be a formal system um, for all of mathematics, they were using mathematical reasoning in the deduction of logic itself. They hoped not only that Principia Mathematica was a good system, but provably had these properties. So if the cons we may write con PM to be a statement which asserts the consistency of Principia Mathematica, uh, if Principia Mathematica, Mathematica truly was a consistent system, hopefully provably so, and if it serves as a basis for all of mathematics, what they were really trying to do is from Principia Mathematica, they were trying to give a proof of the consistency of Principia Mathematica using the tools of Principia Mathematica. Consistency proofs are common. They exist, they're very, they happen all the time. But the thing is you usually, ob observationally, you use techniques from outside the system of a greater system to do it. Certain toy systems may, of course, be consistent because perhaps the, the, the set of well-formed formulas or objects over whatever you're talking about is maybe finite. Maybe you're talking about something so trivial it, couldn't, it can't not be consistent. You know, Arithmetic with no operations, I don't know, something like this, right? But 
they always use techniques from outside the system to try to improve the system. So they were stuck on this for several years. All right. So let's get on to Godel's, uh, Godel's first incompleteness theorem. Uh, any axiomatic system of uh, sufficient arithmetic cannot be both consistent and complete. Any axiomatic system capable of sufficient arithmetic cannot be consistent, both consistent and complete. Let's talk about this. First off, what does sufficient arithmetic mean? So, you know, logic, logicians are extremely pedantic. It's in their nature, like the nature of a snake is to bite. It's the same. Um, if you get formal enough, uh, some of the things I may say today are wrong, but that's okay. We're going to try to give you the high level sort of detail-free version of a lot of these things. That's respectable, I hope. Uh, second is this, what is sufficient arithmetic? Well, it turns out, we'll, we'll elucidate where in the proof the, the, the sufficient arithmetic comes from. But just to give you like a hint, if you consider the naturals under the operations of equality and a multiplication, it turns out you can be consistent and complete. If you consider the naturals only under the operations of equality and addition, you can be consistent and complete. Pressburg arithmetic, Skolem arithmetic. And it, but if you consider both, you have formulas of equality, multiplication, and addition, it turns out you are incomplete. You can't. Sufficient arithmetic for us basically means if you have a system capable of addition and multiplication, uh, you can apply Gödel's incompleteness theorem. Now, it'll be obvious in the proof. Well, a little, it'll be detailed in the proof where that comes in. But basically, you need both. Now, how much of both do you need? Maybe what if you did like a bounded addition? I don't know, something like this. Other people have figured out exactly how little arithmetic you need to get uh, Godel's incompleteness theorem. Sufficient arithmetic for us just means you can do addition and multiplication. Wasn't the original proof like piano arithmetic? Um, used. Yes, but other people, um, piano arithmetic is the axioms of number theory, but it doesn't define the operations of addition or multiplication. I see. It's just the, it's just the, it's just the properties of the natural numbers being closed under equality and things like this. So in fact, those are not operations defined in it. Just equality, ac according to it. So yes, but other people figured out you know, how little do you need? How little arithmetic can you get by with? Right? Um, so before we get into what the actual uh, proof is, now of course there's an easy proof of this that takes one sentence. We're going to do the hard historical way so you get some context about the history. Godel did not know what a computer was. He didn't even know what a string was. So first he. The theory of types prevents you, on the surface, from discussing semantic properties of the, uh, of the language itself. You know? If you want the, you know, the axiomatic system discusses formulas and sets and functions and things, right? But you want it to prevent theorems, the ability of theorems to discuss other theorems. You, know? you want to create an, a second logic, a higher, a meta logic, to discuss the logical symbols, something like this, right? So some, first off, he needs a way to shim the discussion of the objects of the language into the objects about the language, about the theory, into the theory. So he does what's called a Gödel numbering. A Gödel numbering is simply a function to transform a string of symbols, the well-formed formulas, excuse me, the well-formed formulas into numbers, and then use number theory to discuss properties of uh, the objects themselves. So uh, what we're going to do is like consider the following table. Let's say we have x here, the following symbols, and then we have t of x. A well-formed formula is a string defined uh, valid over whatever axiomatic system we're discussing, right? So the symbols uh, that we can may restrict ourselves to include the zero, the successor symbol, negation, logical or, uh, universal quantification, open parenthesis and close parenthesis. And to these, he assigns the first few prime numbers. You get 1, 3, 
Old one's not prime, but let's just give it there. Five, seven, excuse me, the first odd numbers. Nine, 11, 13. Okay. To these, he, he assigns this, the number, uh, the odd numbers 1 through 13. He reserves even numbers for types. Right? It's supposed to be theory of types. This is very specific construction. And then from there, he assigns free variables to be the prime numbers greater than or equal to 13. Excuse me, greater than 13. So x gets assigned 17, and y gets assigned 19, and so on. Right? So the prime number greater than or equal to 17 is the free variable corresponding to x or y. Right? Then what he does is he simply creates this injection gamma if, let's say we have some formula evaluated or not, maybe it's a predicate, but it's consistent of a sequence of symbols f1 to fn, we'll say fk, then what he defines as gamma of f1 to fk to be is uh, the product of i equals 1 to k of the ith prime raised to the t of uh, f of i power, right? So simply, you encode a sequence of symbols into a number. This is called a Gödel numbering. Uh, again, I want to comment, this is not actually super important today. Gödel didn't know what a string was. Everything was numbers. So simply, we need to discuss the objects. We must discuss numbers that represent the objects. Um, for example, what would be uh, uh, of, let's say, what do I have here? For all x, x or negation of x, right? This would be equal to... I'm just going to double check. I got this. This would be equal to 2 to the 9 times uh, 3 to the 17 times uh, 5 to the 11 times x is 17. So we're going to get 3, 5, 7 to the 17 times or is going to be 7. So 9, 11 to the 11. To, oh, God, God. For all x, open x or is going to be 7 times not is going to be 5, so it's going to be 13 to the 5, times x, which is going to be 17 to the 17. Yes, and then we're going to times that by 19 to the 13. Okay, That is some big number. I'm not going to work it out, but you believe me that's some number. The point is that, f first off, the the... the the axiomatic system allows discussion of numbers. Great. We will use it as a hack to discuss the theorems, the, the formula and the predicates of the system using the representation, the num numerical representation of this. I claim this function is injective. Why? Yes. Fundamental theorem of arithmetic. If you have phi, uh, excuse me, gamma of x is equal to gamma of y, that implies that x is equal to y. Symbol for symbol. Yes? Like prime factorizations being unique, like a product of r axioms? Is that? You could prove that from within Principia Mathematica, certainly. We've not derived a contradiction yet. And in fact, it's important that you, for later, that you agree that you can derive the Gödel numbering from within Principia Mathematica itself. The fundamental theorem of arithmetic can be formalized within Principia Mathematica. But that means that this, this theorem only works for systems capable of proving the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, right? You could find, I don't, this specific Gödel numbering, yeah. Could you find a different, more complicated Gödel numbering, perhaps? I don't know, maybe. Convince yourself, though, that if this theorem, that is part of the sufficient arithmetic, first of all. Yeah. The, you can characterize that as this encoding is sufficient arithmetic needs the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Great Maybe comment. this is like two in the details, but how come addition, and, why don't you just say addition and multiplication are the same if just a repeated addition is multiplication? Uh, how do you know how many times to add it? Okay. That n part where you like apply a function n times is the multiplication. That's what you get from multiplication. Right. You can't just say dot, 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 plus in a formal system, you know, and then... Does this work for, like, more arbitrary rings where, like, you have a unique factorization domain so you can do the, like, the thing? Like, the unique prime deal, but, like, over some other, like, arbitrary two operations that, like, distribute and have identity and all things.
Right. I don't know. Um, so the principle of Mathematica, we may suppose, is a formalization of set theory. And then from set theory, you can define, like we did, an ordinal construction of the natural numbers. And then from those ordinal constructions, you can define a Gödel numbering. I suppose you could define, d d d define a, a ring. But we don't need a general principle here. We just need a single one, because we're working the most general theory possible, which is just on sets. So I suppose the fact that principle of Mathematica may be able to define a ring, I don't think is too useful. Um, interesting, interesting comment, though. I'm sure, I'm sure there's been some research in this area. All right, the point of this is the fact that, um, of course, it's injective. And then you can now talk about a, talking about the numbers, the number representation of an object, allows you to discuss metamathematical principles. So first, I'll define A divides B to be the relation to B, mean that there exists some C, which is a natural number, such that AC is equal to B. Then I'll define this relation called prime, which we did last time. But prime of x is defined to be the relation such that x is greater than 1, and there, there, there does not exist z such that, uh, let's make sure I got this exact, uh, z is less than or equal to x, and it is not true that z is equal to 1, and it is not true that z is equal to x, and z divides x. Right? That is the definition of primes. That is a predicate such that it only accepts prime numbers. It's, a predicate, again, is different than an algorithm. This does not tell you how to find prime numbers. It simply is the definition of a prime number. That's kind of an important difference between a predicate and an algorithm. It's just defining what a, what a prime number is. It doesn't give you a procedure or a, a runtime or anything like this. It's just simply the definition. I'm going to give you a few more of Gödel. Gödel constructs, at this point, the most tedious part of his proof, which is a 42-43 formula, such that he needs to prove a certain formula exists. He allows the system to talk about its own uh, properties by construction of these 40 formula. He basically reinvents a computer and then hacks his own computer. So I'm going to give you a few formula. I want you to tell me what these do. Consider this one called GL, which I couldn't figure out what it stands for, but it is German, probably. So GL, we mean that, uh, first I'll say, let uh, the predicate PRN be the nth prime number. right? How that one is defined is actually done inductively, so I'm going to skip that predicate. It's actually the third one, though. But suppose we define GLX of n and x to mean that there exists some y such that uh, y is less than or equal to x, and uh, x divides pr of n to the y, and it is not true that x divides uh, pr of n to the y plus 1. What does this one do? What y, or excuse me, what x satisfies this? Hope I have that right. What y is this true for? What do you know if x is a number that divides into the nth prime number raised to the yth power, but does not divide into the nth prime number raised to the y plus 1th power? Yeah? x has to be equal to the nth prime number to the yth power. It has to be equal to the nth prime number to the yth power? Yes, but we want, that's correct, but we want the y for this to be true. The quantification is over the y, so we want that y. So it actually means that uh, whatever the nth prime number is in the product of x, that's going to be y. It's going to be that value right there. What he's doing here is he invented array access 
he's saying y is equal to x at index n. This is a formula that takes in a Gödel numbering of a sim of a x is a Gödel numbering. It's an encoding of some formula. This is how you access the nth symbol of the formula. So you can use number theory and divisibility properties to access elements of the string. This will return whatever symbol is at the nth spot. Okay? Convoluted, but again, computers don't exist yet. This is like 1921. He invents an array access mechanism. Here's another one I'll give you, and then after this I'll spare you. Uh, let L of x um, be defined as there exists some y, so what y has the property such that y is less than or equal to x, and uh, GL of y plus 1, uh, GL of y plus 1 comma x is equal to 0. What is the greatest y for this is true for? I hope I got this formula correct. And the length, essentially, of the. This is the length of the formula. This is a formula given in Gödel numbering x will give you the length of the sequence that encoded that Gödel numbering. He invents a length formula. Crazy that 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 he has to invent basically this. It goes on for several more pages, six, seven pages like this, okay? He creates formula recursively from other formula. He has helper functions. He's really doing computer science when he does this. Two important formula that he comes up with that we care about. One is called, is called this, the demonstrates relation. So x is a demonstration of y if this is defined to mean that this, the Gödel, x is a Gödel numbering of some formula, we'll call it gamma inverse of x, is some math, mathematical object, a theorem or whatever is a proof of the number, the object that y is a numbering of. Now, demonstrates, the way this is supposed to be read is that x is a number which represents a proof picture, which is itself a proof of the theorem which y is a Gödel numbering of. Convoluted to do it that way, we can just say, what we can say is really that x is a proof of y. We do it in this hacky way because we need to encode things in the system, but this is really what it's saying. X is a proof of Y. Now, how does demonstrates work? He goes through several pages to build up these atomic primitives to generate this. All this relation does is it checks two things. First, it checks that X is a proof. By a proof, it's a sequence of numberings of lines. Each line is syntactically valid. Each line is either an axiom or a deduction from the previous two rows which are themselves perhaps axioms, or those are recursively defined. So this relation simply checks if, a, if it's a proof. Now, finding a proof and checking a proof are very different. You can always check if a proof is syntactically valid. right? In fact, you can always check a proof correctly prove something. You can always check if a proof is correct, mechanically so. That's not anything sneaky. You just check if it's an axiom or if it's an application of the axioms. I mean, that's how it works. Then all it does is use the length and the array access to check if the last line of the proof is y. If the last line of the proof is y, and the proof is correct, then x is a proof of y. That's how this works. Right. So he spends the whole time to build up that specific relation. That's the important one. On the way there, he also proves another following relation. This is not a relation in the sense that it returns Boolean. But it is a function. So what it does is like uh, whenever a v, a free variable in x, not x is a numbering, but the formula representing x, substring replace v with y. So what we mean here is that this is kind of like evaluation, but in a more formalist sense, where wherever the symbol v appears in uh, x, wherever the symbol appears, replace that symbol with the substring representation exactly of y. So if the v, free variable v appears in x, replace that free variable with a y. 
This is kind of like an evaluation routine, this, but it's a string substitution routine. It's totally syntactical, right? It doesn't evaluate a function at anything. It just replaces every instance of x with 3. When we're returning things with the existential quantifier, is it just like, are you using the successor function a bunch of times to encode the number? I am specifically avoiding discussion about some of the sufficient arithmetic here. You need something called primitive recursion, and you have to do this whole thing, and then the proof is very outdated and complicated. But convince yourself that these are simply defined over the well-formed formulas of Principia Mathematica. Okay. That's the best I can give you. Um, it's not the sense of it's not a computer program, like a function returns a value yeah. in the sense, but kind of. It's okay to think of it that way for our coping mechanisms, right? He is doing this very methodically and very carefully using the symbols in the language. He's not describing something outside of the language. He's doing this on purpose for two reasons. One, there is no intuitionistic ob objection to it later on. He's doing it very, he's make, he even makes sure that every quantifier is bounded and things like this. So you don't do any objectionable activity. And two, because we need the fact that the proof can be formalized from within the system later. So this is a very careful thing he's done, right? The point is that he invents a computer architecture only to hack it, right? Um, computers, of course, don't exist, but he has to array basic, he has to invent basic operations. Substring replacement is an interesting one. Evaluation of an array, sub, uh, interesting one, and so on, right? So let's get on to the proof. The proof is actually quite short. Um, consider the following uh, formula. Excuse me, it's a predicate because it has not yet been evaluated. Uh, f of x is a predicate with free variable x, which is equivalent to there does not exist p, such that p demonstrates uh, the substitution of when you take x, whenever you see 17 as a free variable in x, and you substring replace it with x. Okay. Two things first off. For 17 here, by the way, is the numbering of x. Okay? So there's a difference here between a description of an object and like the use of an object. Here, x is the thing that's being replaced into. But we're looking into wherever x appears as a free variable in x and replacing that with x. Why we need to do that will make sense in a second. Now, this is a predicate. Its truth value cannot be evaluated. Its truth value can only be assigned once its free variable has either been bound or it's been evaluated. Let's evaluate it at a number. Let's, in fact, evaluate it at a specific number. This is a predicate. Therefore, it has a Gödel numbering. The Gödel numbering, we may say, is gamma of f. Gamma of f is just some number. OK? Let's evaluate gamma of f. Let's evaluate f at gamma of f. So we're going to get. Uh, f evaluated at the number, which is gamma of f, is equal, in the most trivial sense, is a replacement of the variables x. There does not exist p, such that p demonstrates uh, the substitution of uh, gamma of p, gamma of f, 17, um, gamma of f, right? We simply evaluated it at x. This is a little complicated looking. Let's simplify. I'm going to take this internal routine and examine it and see if we can shorten that. So we take the substitution, we apply the substitution routine on gamma of f. Every time a 17 appears, we replace that with gamma of f. Okay? Now here, the same thing is being used three times, essentially. We're going to take gamma of f. This is a number, but we want to go into the object that this is a numbering of. Everywhere 17 exists in that, num in that string, we will replace that string x with the symbols gamma open f close. So the same thing is kind of used three times here. Let's do that. I'm going to literally take gamma of f. I'm going to take f, write it, and then replace x with gamma of f. So we get that this is equal to, I'll write it here. 
there does not exist P. D, D P demonstrates substitution, and then X appears. So I'm going to replace that with gamma of F, 17. And I'll replace this X with gamma of F. What I did here was I literally took x here and I replaced it with gamma of f, OK? But what is substitute gamma of f 17 gamma of f? Symbol for symbol, this is identical to something that's already on the board. There does not exist p such that p demonstrates substitution gamma of f 17 gamma of f is exactly what happens when you take substitution gamma of f 17 gamma of f. So in fact, what is this equal to? It's just. Um, f of gamma of f. It's the same thing. We took a small part of the formula, we tried to simplify and expand it, and we got back in the description of the whole formula. To rewrite, we have f of gamma of f to be, uh, there does not exist P, uh, such that P demonstrates um, F of gamma of F. Right? That still looks a little complicated. Let's simplify this and call this G for Godel. G then is, there does not exist P such that P demonstrates G. Okay, what does G mean semantically? There does not exist a proof of G, like of itself. Yes. I am not provable. Using this shim of Gödel numberings, we were able to sort of hack it, get the system to talk about itself. Notice we didn't really explain the details of Principia Mathematica, which prevented, tried to prevent self-reference. Yet, such a, if anything can talk about numbering is like in such a way, you could still shim it into talking about itself. This demonstrates relation. I'll also say is very specific to the axioms. It's very specific to the axioms of Principia Mathematica. Whatever those are, it's provable. It demonstrates within respect to those axioms. Um, G is provable. G says there does not exist P such that P demonstrates G, as in there is no proof of me. Right? Since we are consistent and complete, uh, assume to the contrary. Let me say it this way. In, I'll say. I'll say Principia Mathematica is consistent and complete. We have two cases. Case one, uh, G is a symbol that has been defined. It is a well-formed formula over the formal language of Principia Mathematica. We were able to construct G using a very complicated set of routines, but G was constructible. So G must. And also notice G has no free variables, and therefore must be assigned a truth value. By completeness, G is either true or false. Okay? So G is true. Actually, not by completeness, but by the fact that every um, well-formed formula over no free variables has to have a truth value, G is either true or false. If G is true, a G is uh, not provable. So. A G is an example of a true and unprovable statement. Uh, this implies that Principia Mathematica is not complete. Recall everything that is true must have a proof that it is true. But if G is true, then G is true but not provable. And therefore, there does not exist a proof of G. So there exists a statement which is true, yet has no proof. Therefore, we are not complete. 
Well, suppose G is not true then. G is false. Uh, if G is false, then we know that the negation of G must be true. But the negation of G can be defined to be there does not exist, there does not exist P such that P demonstrates G. Right? Apply the axiom of double negation. We're going to get that there exists P such that such that P demonstrates G. And from that we get that G is provable. So G is provable, but anything that is provable is true. Anything that has a proof by soundness is called soundness. If something has a proof, then it must be true. That's sort of the definition. If G is provable, it is true. So negation of G is true, and G is true. So we see that G and negation of G is true by addition. So Principia Mathematica is inconsistent. Contradiction. Principia Mathematica cannot be both consistent and complete. Questions on the proof? This was kind of a pretty uh, foundational shakeup when this was announced. It's probably one of the greatest theorems. It, particularly for the reason that um, you know these formalists were and logicists were working in a direction hoping to show Principia Mathematica was both consistent and complete and at everything, but Gödel showed that if you have a system powerful enough to get sufficient arithmetic. If you have enough in you to define such a demonstrates relation, and you don't need much to do so, as he showed, then you can always construct such a sentence D, a sentence G, and therefore you can never be consistent and complete simultaneously. Questions? Yes. Does the contradiction not show that G must always be true, or is this? I think I'm getting lost in like the meta. The contr the 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 uh, assume to the contrary that P is consistent and complete. If G is, so G, not by assumptions to the contrary, but G in general is constructed through Principia Mathematica, must be assigned a truth value. If G is consistent, if G, excuse me, if G is true, we are incomplete. If G is false, then we are inconsistent. So it's, we are, and G must be true or false, so we're either inconsistent or we're incomplete. Okay. We don't know which one, I guess. It's called the incompleteness theorem and not the inconsistency theorem because we require consistency as the bare minimum to turn on the computer. We need the consistency. Con completeness would be nice. Consistency is required. If you are inconsistent, great. We have a complete. Here's every inconsistent theorem. And every inconsistent theory, in fact, is complete because you simply prove using a trick that um, using the inconsistency to prove uh, it to be true. So it's called the incompleteness theorem because we want really case one. It has to be consistent, bare minimum. G is true and unprovable. Questions on that? All right, let's talk about a second incompleteness theorem. Uh, I think the story goes something like he presented this at a conference. Von Neumann comes up to the table, particularly interested in it. And uh, later writes to him a uh, discovery of the second incompleteness theorem. But he already figured it out for himself. So let's try this. Uh, Godel's second incompleteness theorem is uh, Principia Mathematica cannot prove the consistency of Principia Mathematica. Principia Mathematica is any such uh, formal system. No Axiomatic system is capable of proving its own consistency. This is the second theorem. How do we prove this? First, we can write consist the consistency of Principia Mathematica as a relation over the well-formed symbols of uh, the language. So this is going to be for all x. Uh, either there exists y. Excuse me. We'll do p and q. There exists some p 
such that p demonstrates x, or there exists q such that q demonstrates uh, the negation of x. I'll give myself some room. Okay. Negation of x here is a predicate that is defined, uh, which simply concatenates the negation symbol to the front of the whole thing. That's all it does. Shifts everything over, multiplies by 2 to the power of whatever the table value was for it. That's all it does. So basically what we say is a, a system is consistent. Uh, oh, no, I did this wrong. Not if there exists a proof P or its negation, but there does not exist a proof of, uh, there does not exist a proof of both P uh, and its negation, right? So how should this be? Uh, for all p, for all q, uh, it is not true that uh, p demonstrates x and q demonstrates uh, the negation of x, right? Is that correct? There is no proof of x and the negation of x. OK, good. I think that's correct. If there is, there does, for all x, there does, there does not exist a proof of it and its negation, that means we are free of contradiction. Any typos here? I think this is, I think this is fine, right? Again, this is something formalized in uh, this set of symbols. Um, so basically, the proof of the second incompleteness theorem follows by looking carefully at the construction of the proof of the first theorem. Um, what we really did was we did a proof by contradiction, assuming to the contrary, right? All you do is re replace the assumption with the con assumption to the contrary, with an with a proof of the consistency of the. Uh, so you assume to the contrary it's consistent. Instead, replace that assumption to the contrary with a proof of the consistency of P principle of Mathematica. So assume to the contrary that there exists a proof in Principia Mathematica which proves the consistency of Principia Mathematica. Notice that in the proof of the first theorem, we really show that the, the assumption of the consistency of Principia Mathematica proves some statement g, and I'll write it like this as an implication, among other things, are taken. But the consistency of Principia Mathematica implies the construction of some statement g. So if Principia Mathematica and the consistency of Principia Mathematica if, you, if there exists a proof of the consistency of Principia Mathematica, then take it as a theorem plus the axiom of Principia Mathematica, and this will give you a proof of G, of sentence G, right? So G is provable. Let me see exactly how I worded this. So G is provable. There exists a proof of G, right? So if G is provable, what do we know? That means G is true. If G is provable, then it's true. But if G is true, then G is not provable. So uh, G is provable and not provable, violating consistency. Again, these are really theorems over, you know, they stand on their own independent of meaning, but of course they have deep philosophical impact. Importantly, to the second incompleteness theorem really says Bertrand Russell is a loser. Um, 20 years of your life you spend working on a document and you never bothered to check that the negation could be possible, that the reverse of what you're trying to prove could perhaps be a barrier. It took Gödel, I don't know, like an hour to figure this out, I'm sure. But... In an hour, he basically ruined 20 years of another guy's life work. I think that is sort of uh, really beautiful in its own right. You know, imagine spending 20 years on something. That's part of the interest in these theorems for me personally is not just the um, philosophical implications of this, but the 
uh, drama around the people involved in this, right? Are there any questions on the second incompleteness theorem? Yes. I was wondering is how come proofs by contradiction are allowed if we don't know a system's consistent? Because Great question. They appear consistent, certainly. Uh, the axioms we use today, Z of C, although by Gödel's theorems we cannot prove we're consistent, they don't immediately appear to rise to the surface a consistency issue. They appear as if the situation basically is like it's consistent, but we can't prove it. Okay, so, so I mean, like contradiction proof would technically be wrong, like hypothetically. When you do a proof by contradiction, you assume to the contrary. So let's say you do a proof by contradiction. What you do is assume to the contrary that principia mathematica plus the negation of some statement p is true, and then that implies. Uh, let's say that proves uh, some some absurdity zero equals one. And then from that, you take as evidence that that implies p, right? If you assume something to the contrary, you derive it. Uh, if Principia Mathematica was, so I, I suppose that's true. If you're working with an inconsistent system, you don't have proof by contradiction. It's assumed that the contradiction uh, occurs from the assumption to the contrary to produce, produce the absurdity. But if the absurdity came from the inconsistency of Principia Mathematica itself, then this, wasn't, this wouldn't really prove negation of p. But if Principia Mathematica was itself inconsistent, then um, both everything is true and false simultaneously. So the model of truth is destroyed anyway. Yeah. So I guess what it's trying to say is like Principia Mathematica, I mean, these guys designed this system very carefully. They probably didn't introduce an inconsistency on purpose. It's simply the case that Principia Mathematica, if consistent, and certainly is consistent, cannot be proven to be consistent. So it's a lack of proof of, these, uh, of a truth again. Principia Mathematica, I would put a huge betting odds is consistent, but of course we can never prove it. Well, also, like, if the system is inconsistent, then not only do proofs by contradiction not work, all proofs don't work, so it doesn't matter. And you yeah. certainly can do a proof by contradiction specifically and only to prove the, like, you, 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 a proof by contradiction does work exactly and only in the case where you're considering a proof of the system's consistency, because there's two cases. Either it isn't, either it isn't inconsistent, so it doesn't matter, and the proof by contradiction can work or not work, but it's inconsistent. Or That's a great comment. the yeah. proof is consistent, in which case then the sub, like on a sub-meta level, then you can suppose for the contradiction, and then the proof by contradiction works, and then you prove that it's inconsistent. And so either way, you end up that it's inconsistent. I see. I agree with that. But I will tell you conventionally, people, t people will take um, that a system which is inconsistent does not have a, a model of truth. This concept of truth is not defined, so you may just simply assume everything to be true and false simultaneously. It's not worth study. But I, exactly what you're saying is part of the reason why that's the convention. You, if you break it up into two cases, the absurdity occurs here or the absurdity occurs here. If it occurs here, certainly P is true anyway, because everything is true and false. If the absurdity occurs here by assumption of consistency, then it's fine. So assuming consistency of a system is usually not controversial, actually. It's like conditional, sometimes a proof is conditional on that assumption, which of course it's known from the discourse can't be proven, but that's okay. Right. Further questions on Gödel's two incompleteness theorems? Again, the construction I think is probably, probably one of the more beautiful parts. Oh, uh, final question. What is, this, what is the name of this proof technique? Diagonalization. This is a proof by diagonalization. Gödel used a, set, used a negated self-reference to construct the sentence that says, I am not provable. Okay, the sentence discusses, although prevented from discussion of its own truth, it is not prevented from discussion of its own provability. And in fact, by sufficient arithmetic, can never be can never avoid discussion of its own provability. Right? It uh, again, probably the world's greatest hack to invent a, a computer to don't know that he did that and then hack the computer in order to get this. I think that's insane. So uh, the logical arguments, the setup of the Gödel numberings is actually quite technical and. If you want to go through it, it would take like two and a half hours for us to figure out why the code does work. For example, the, 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 the predicate that does what we would call now string concatenation is like five lines long of nested quantifiers and things. It's quite, it's quite tedious and difficult, but 40 helper formula later, he gets out demonstrates as a relation. So that's all that matters is the demonstrates one. Further questions? All right, let me try to do my little... We're going we're gonna to spoil the end of the uh, graphic novel. Do all off. Give me a second. No.
Don't look at that one. Um, let me do. Uh, oh, oh, hold on. Sorry. Um, maybe I could do this. Okay. All right. We're doing this side of the room. Okay. Let's see where we were. So the book does quite a lot of digression. Um, here we go. Um, so uh, something happens with David Hilbert. He's like the, the lead formalist. It's Hilbert's program that we're involved with of creating a foundation for all mathematics. Something happens with his son I don't exactly remember. Um, okay. At this point, I returned to logic. For while I was experimenting with education, logicians based on our principia reached the apex of the struggle towards my youthful dream. To build mathematics on absolute certainty, to place the lowest of the beastly things on granite foundations. Yes, and without the abstract language of principia, this would have been a pipe dream. Though I still felt personally that I had failed. True to the spirit of his Paris 1900 talk that had also inspired me so much, David Hilbert continued to preach on preach as the, high, as the struggle's high priest. He spread his message by every means available, including the, the newest technology of the radio. With the, new tools of with the tools of the new logic, we shall at last cement the cornerstone of our science, the provability of every mathematical statement or its negation. We Never for us the pessimistic ignorambus. Our battle cry is never ignorambus. We must know, we shall know. His message had inspired, among others, a recent acquaintance of mine to be. So there's Godel reading the third book of Principia Mathematica. This, I can't tell you how tedious this work is. Five people in the world have ever read it. One of them is Godel. Um, a speaker at the next logical conference held right inside the lair of Vienna Circle. Hello, Schlick. Have you discovered Wittgenstein's true age yet? Haha, ha, he returns to Vienna soon. We'll observe empirically. I present a brilliant young colleague of mine, her, Dr. von Neumann. I think he does or doesn't show up in the new Oppenheimer, mo Oppenheimer movie. But as a computer science student, you should know the name von Neumann from somewhere. He invented part of the computer, the von Neumann architecture and stuff. His name appears all the time in quantum physics. And say, I wonder how you chaps can like me and Wittgenstein, especially given our differences on mathematics. Maybe the next speaker will settle matters in your favor. Oh. Rumor has it he solved Hilbert's second problem, the consistency and completeness of arithmetic, and thus all mathematics. My goodness gracious. It's hard to exaggerate the feeling of excitement, of, anticipa of excited anticipation as Kurt Gödel began his talk. Her professors Hilbert and Russell, distinguished colleagues, I will speak to you of, he's a Platonist, light years from Wittgenstein, my research on the provability of propositions of arithmetic. Like you, he believes logic is an image of the highest form of truth. The powerful methods of the Principia now allow us for the first time in history to speak of a correctly formulated question in theories of mathematics, and thus further to ask, is a correctly formulated mathematical question necessarily answerable? And there's Hilbert with his little hat in the front, obviously. In other matters, in other words, is every mathematical statement provable either the statement itself or if it states something false, it's opposite? To this most fundamental question, I have found the answer, which is... No. Or to put it differently, there will always be unanswerable questions. What? Er, her doctor, sure you mean, you mean unanswered questions, that's piano. No, no, since the scope of truth is infinite, obviously there will always be unanswered questions. What I mean now was precisely this, unanswerable. What I have proved in essence is that arithmetic, and thus also any system based off it, is of necessity incomplete. In Godel's lecture, the audience had expected the confirmation of their most cherished vision. They got something completely different. So Gen R is not provable. For if it were, there would be an N such that. And you can see some of his notation back there. He says, uh, you can see the 17 he uses for, and then Bu there means provable, right, in German. So there's some of his old uh, stuff. All over. Von Neumann's comment sums it up, perfectly sums it up. Sums up the essence of Godel's proof. I know it may be hard for laypersons to understand, but for a lot of very intelligent people, the incompleteness theorem meant the end of a dream. The dream had theological ancestry. Its credo had been written in Greek two and a half millennia ago. And now suddenly the rug had been pulled from under the feet of, their dream of the dreamers. Her professor, would you like us to take you to, the to, ta take you to your hotel? That is the beauty. That is the terror of mathematics. There is no getting around a proof, even if that proves something is unprovable. Let him be. 
it's over then. Well, that was von Neumann's first reaction, but things turned out differently very uh, very, uh, but things later turned out very di differently. The journey through abstract thought from Aristotle via Boole all the way to Gödel's theorem in effect led to a new beginning, which was, look, new beginnings, we have our series of old endings to complete. I think, yes, and then it goes on differently. So there's, there's uh, with Genstein, the Tractatus, and then some violence goes on, and some things happen. You know, this is pre-war Germany. There's not a happy ending for anyone in this book. So, but that was the ending of the book. That was the ending of uh, Gödel's incompleteness theorem. Any questions? Awesome. Let's take our little break. <laughs>